Feel free to ask me questions if you have any, Caden. I'm trying to uh, catch up here. Uh, internet's going very slowly. Yeah, um, the Chapter 9 work, is that in Pearson itself? Because I didn't see it in Canvas. Yes, it's just in, in Canvas. I'm actually checking right now, uh, adjusting the due dates and that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, chapter nine, conceptual and homework is supposed to be due tomorrow, but I'm changing that. I'm going to go ahead and move it back to the 31st for both of, both of those. Okay, thanks. No problem. And it's, uh, like I said, it is in, uh, in, uh, my, my lab and mastering, sorry. <laughs> I'll struggle where it was. Okay, I just adjusted some dates for Chapter 8 as well, just because I had knew I had some students that weren't quite there yet. <laughs> just remembering a song. Not quite there yet. Who was that guy, anyways? <laughs> Okay, well, that's weird. Maybe this one over here. Cross check. Man, I can't find it. That was funny. Oh, well. Man, this is really taking a long time. This thing ain't working for crap. Let's try again. That's it. Hobo Johnson, Subaru Cross Track.
<laughs> that was great. <laughs> Yep, Hobo Johnson, Subaru Crosstrack. One of my nieces got a Subaru Crosstrack, and I sent her that song so she got it. She had never heard it. It's pretty funny. All right, we got more people. Woohoo! Hey, Jennifer, feel free to ask questions before we get started. We got about three more minutes, but it's only you and Caden and me here so far. I'm good. Ooh, I've got a dollar on my desk. Good day. Lucky dollar. <laughs> exactly. Uh oh, Tessie said to call me. Hello. Oh, it's so nice to talk to you. <laughs> I haven't seen you in forever. Yes, I am finally home now. How can I help you, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I actually set it to tomorrow uh, was the end date for it. So if, if he has timing fit in tomorrow, that'll be fine. If not, he needs to let me know and I'll set it later. Okay, no problem. Tell him to make sure he checks your hours so he don't come in too late for you. <laughs> you have a good one. Thank you, ma'am. Bye-bye. <laughs> it's like my fourth call from the testing center today. Had a student making up a test, so. Figured I'd have to do something. I think what was the last one I did? I still got about a minute, guys, but feel free to ask me if you think of anything. I'm going to check what I did last time with you guys and see if... Uh, Make sure I didn't do something I thought I might have uh, not done. Yeah, put enough negatives on there. I'm sure somebody's not going to understand, so I'll be good. Okay, I did do that one. All right. Well, it's definitely time to get started, even though I've got exactly five of y'all in here. Oh, six is on the way. Uh, I asked one more time. I've asked basically most of these people, but if anybody has any questions, go ahead and ask me now. Otherwise, we can go ahead and get started. When we finished last time, I'd actually worked some of the conservation of momentum problems, specifically the ones with elastic collisions in one dimension, head-on collisions. And I showed you a neat little trick, and, and that trick is something you should commit to memory, not necessarily the final answers, 
though if you actually figure out how to derive it yourself you you probably will have those answers uh memorized so it is worthwhile uh i'll just point out to you that in fact uh let me do a little p compare and contrast if you will for the equations of uh head-on collisions specifically with regards to uh, them being elastic and a more general response. So uh, what I wanna do is point out the similarities with the Atwood machine. So I'm gonna point this out by sharing the screen with you guys as people are coming in. Uh, that way I, I still will keep on pace as far as keeping the course going, but I'm doing something that's not all that critical in the event that they don't show up until a little bit more time has passed. So I just want to remind you that when we did the Atwood machine, remember the Atwood machine was basically a pulley with a mass hanging from each side. So you can imagine, for instance, a mass on this side and then another mass, say, on this side. Well, I don't know why it went like that, but that's that's what it <laughs> that's what the thing drew. Uh, anyways, uh, let's call this one. Uh, I'm going to assume this one's the bigger one, so I'm going to say this is M B, and I'll say this is M A, and I assumed it's a bigger one just because it's higher up, so to lift the other one. But what we learned was when we did this for the Atwood machine, we got M B minus m a over m b uh, a plus m b that was the uh the unitless term that was in front of the constant g so the acceleration of the atwood machine is basically the difference in the mass divided by the sum of the mass which is kilograms over kilograms multiplied by g the other part that was kind of interesting was the tension in the ropes turned out to be, uh, you can write it a couple different ways, but we can say it's 2MA over MA plus MB. So again, that's sort of the dimensionless part or the unitless part, but then there's MB times G. So that's the Atwood machine. And it's not related. I mean, these equations mean entirely different things. But the neat part is that the form of them is pretty close. Because if you look at a general expression, <laughs> head-on collisions, uh, and we found part of these already. For instance, we can say that the head-on collision uh, between a, a mass M sub A and a mass M sub B a, assuming that MA and MB are both moving initially now, when you actually do that, you can find that the velocity of A after the collision is actually, and I'm going to write it in a different form than your book did, uh, just to make a point, okay? So I'm going to write the VB term first. In other words, basically the answer is going to be some number times VA plus some number times VB. So when I go to write the number in terms of uh, VA for or in terms of VB, for instance, this is going to be two times MB. Notice the two up there over MA plus MB. And that's the unitless part. But in fact, that is multiplied by VB. Whoa, nearly. That is multiplied by VB. And then there's a, a term multiplied by VA. Now, this one's going to look familiar as well, but it's going to be in the backwards order. So it'll be MA minus MB over MA plus MB. Now, that's the unitless part again. So it's going to be just multiplied by VA. So I think you can see how much uh, these two look like the two expressions for the Atwood machine. Now look at VB prime. So this is the velocity of the target particle, even though it was actually moving in this derivation, uh, the target particle. And see how it differs. Huh. Excuse me. So in this case, it's going to be uh, 
and actually it'd probably be better for me to write the other term first. So I'm going to say M, whoa, no, they, actually I'm going to erase a bunch of stuff. I'm going to say M B minus M A over M A plus M B. Now that's the one that looks like the acceleration and that's the actual one that'll be multiplied by VB. So notice the acceleration one goes with the one uh, that has the same sign. So for instance, this B here goes with this B here, goes with the acceleration term. Just like this A here goes with this A here, goes with this acceleration term. But the one in the front is right there as well, just like the one in the front is right there as well. So that's part of the result. The other part of the result is, of course, for the VB prime, we're going to have two. Notice before we had VA prime was 2MB. Well, VB prime is going to be 2MA. And then all that will be divided by MA plus MB. And then, of course, notice the MA is going to be multiplied by the thing that matches it, which in this case is the VA. Okay. So the actual matching velocity, VB with VB prime, for instance, gets the acceleration term, or VA with VA prime gets the acceleration term, but the other term doesn't match and gets the tension term. So that's the main point I wanted to make, just because uh, when you see formulas that are so uh, similar like that, that means you sort of got a little bit of a break from having to memorize stuff because it's already built in. Uh. In such an easy way, and chances are you might have already had the Atwood machine memorized. Uh, now, all of this, the der derivation of these two equations, is actually problem number 34 of your text. Uh, I've shown you how to do it yesterday, or excuse me, Thursday, no, Wednesday. I showed you how to do it. Uh, this is problem number 34 from chapter nine so you can actually finish this derivation if you'd like uh by doing problem 34 and they even explain a little bit to you but like i said i already did something like this in the previous uh class where i did it with one of them sitting perfectly still yeah. i have not yawned at all today anyways anybody have any questions on any of this All right, so what I'd like to do now is I'm going to go ahead and uh, work a couple more problems so we can finish off this chapter uh, nine stuff. So I'm going to start off with something like uh, something like example nine. I'm going to call this example one. Whoa, no. Evidently, that's going to just randomly draw stuff. So this is example one for today. And with example one today, basically, I'm going to imagine that a proton is going to run into a, a different particle. So what I'm going to have is, let's say, a mass of the proton moving with a velocity. Uh, in this case, let's call the mass of the proton mass A. And then I'm going to say this is velocity A. And I'm going to say its mass is three, or its velocity is uh, about uh, 4.6 times 10 to the uh, fifth meters per second. And I'm going to say that's going to run into another particle. In this case, I'm going to treat it like an alpha particle. So an alpha particle is basically a helium nucleus, which is two hydrogen or it's two protons and two neutrons. So this one's going to be mass alpha, which we're going to call M sub B, because we've been using A and B before. And this one's initially at rest. So we're going to say VB is equal to zero. And it's going to be a head-on elastic collision. So let's name this hit on elastic collision 
and hit on means it's one dimensional. So the only thing that could possibly happen other than hitting directly is, is they completely miss each other. And therefore VA becomes VA prime and VB remains zero. Now, in this case, what we're going to do is try to find out after the collision what's going on. So we'll say this is MA with a new velocity VA prime, and this is MB with a new velocity VB prime. And I'm not making any judgments as to whether it's going to go left or right or anything like that. I'm just saying to the right, and I'm going to put everything in as if it's uh, positive. So starting off with conservation of momentum, with conservation of momentum, I've got MA VA plus zero is equal to MA VA prime plus MB VB prime. Okay, so that's one of the equations we actually have. And of course, remember the MB is actually the uh, alpha particle. And in fact, we could uh, write the mass as, uh, let's say, just for the record, uh, mass of the proton is 1.01 U, and the mass of the alpha particle is supposed to be about 4.00 U. And of course, remember the U is a unit that basically is 1 over Avogadro's number uh basically and then you have to move the the thing because that'll come out in grams so you have to move the decimal three places and that'll fix it uh you won't really need to, to convert it between that because you just know the ratio and that's good enough so with that in mind uh we can actually use the other equation specifically equation 9 8 so using equation 9 dash 8 uh, that equation was, I'll write it in all its glory right here, that was supposed to be VA minus VB is equal to the negative of VA prime minus VB prime. Now, the only way we make it any different for this particular problem is we assume that VB is equal to zero. So I'm just going to go like this and erase that. Okay. So when you do that, you can uh, now go ahead and solve this, for instance. Oops. You can go ahead and solve this particular expression, for instance, uh, for VB prime, just because I'm looking for something that I can start removing. Uh, actually, I don't want, I think I'll do VA prime, uh, just so I can start removing unknowns. So if I, if I do VA prime, uh, notice the VA is equal to the negative VA prime plus VB prime. So if I take the VA prime on the left-hand side, that's going to become positive. And then on the right-hand side, the VB prime is positive. And then the VA will come out to be negative. So this will be the VA on this side. So if I use that expression, then I can plug it back into the first expression. So we begin as follows, basically plugging 9-8 into, let's call this 1. Okay, so I'm going to plug that in. What I'm going to get is MA times VA. And then that's going to be equal to MA times VA prime. But instead of VA prime, I'm going to write MA times parenthesis VB prime minus VA. And now I've got the second term, which is the MB VB prime. So plus MB VB prime like that. Now I can simplify a little bit more. I'm going to start on the left-hand side just to leave me plenty of room. Uh, I didn't get to work this uh, since last week, so I don't really necessarily recall everything that's going to happen. So we're just going to wing it and see what happens. So I'm leaving extra space and all that good stuff. If I distribute through, I've got MAVB prime minus MAVA. 
and then plus M B V B prime like that. Uh, I'm really looking for one of the primes, obviously, because we're going on the assumption, well, we actually know, for instance, that the initial velocities are known. The first one, uh, A, was given and the B was zero. Uh, I can take the term that is MAVA and bring it over to this side. And obviously, it's going to become positive at that point. And then with that in mind, we're going to get 2M. A V A that takes care of this term that takes care of this term and then I've got a VB prime left in both of the terms on the right hand side so what I'm going to do is say equals and now I'm going to say M A minus M B because you can see the M A is multiplied by VB prime and the M B is multiplied oops, by VB prime, but that's actually positive, not a negative. Sorry about that. Almost made a mistake. Uh, so notice the VB prime with the MB actually had a positive. So now I can factor out the MA plus MB, and all that's left is MA plus MB in parentheses times VB prime. So now I can solve for VB prime and say VB prime is actually equal to 2MA over again i'm writing it as some dimensionless quantity multiplied by a quantity whose dimensions are exactly what we want so in this case i'm saying times va okay so that is actually the velocity of the uh, alpha particle after the collision so we can say v alpha which is VB prime, meaning after the collision, that's going to be 2 times 1.01 U over 1.01 U plus 4.00 U. All of that times the velocity was 4.6 times 10 to the fifth. meters per second and that was the initial velocity of the proton uh now uh, that's being used to find the final velocity of the alpha particle so in this case it's two times 1.01 .01 divided by parentheses 1.01 .01 plus 4 close parentheses and that gives me 0 0.4031 so 0 0.4031 times 4.60 e to the fifth gives me 4.6. Whoa, Nelly. Oh, no wonder times. 0 0.4031936128. I went ahead and put in all the digits just because I'm obsessive compulsive. So this is going to be 1.855. Uh, so that second five is of course not a significant figure uh it's 1.85469 basically uh which is 1.855 times 10 to the fifth so that's the velocity of the alpha particle after the collision any questions on that one Now that we have that, we can go back and use the purple equation, the VA prime equals VB prime minus VA. We can use that to find the VA prime. So what I'm going to do is say equation 9-8 gives us VA prime is equal to VB prime minus VA. So that's going to be 1.855, again, extra digit, times 10 to the fifth meters per second, minus VA, which is 4.60 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. Now, notice you're getting a negative value here. That should be expected. You basically sent in something that's about one fourth of the mass of something else and you ran it into it really quickly. So you expect it to bounce back a little bit. 
and that's what's happening here. So I'm going to say 1.855 times 10 to the fifth minus 4.6 e to the fifth. That gives me negative 2.755 or 45. So negative 2.7. Uh, four, five. Uh, that's actually one, two. Yeah. I want one more significant figure. So there's another five that's not significant and that's times 10 to the fifth meters per second. And that's V proton after. Notice it is negative. Anybody have any questions on that? All right. So that's a, another example of a head-on collision, something you should be able to do. As I've given you here, the, these equations, uh, let me circle them in a distinct color. These equations are something you could derive on your own. And if you take the time to derive them on your own, especially if you do it more than once, you will almost certainly memorize them. So I highly recommend that. It would be a nice little touchstone in, in an exam, especially a final exam where you're stressed out or in a test. It'll be a nice little uh touchstone for you to see oh yeah i did did do this right because i just plugged it into the formula i memorized and seemed to have gotten the exact same answer i did just now so i know that it's probably correct no questions on that okay man we really don't have too many people in here today do we oh well so let's move along looks like we don't have any questions on that uh i need to solve some more problems and specifically, uh, I'd like to solve a ballistic pendulum problem. So here we go with the ballistic pendulum. So the ballistic pendulum, you can imagine, is something like this. So let's say this is a ceiling. And let's say hanging from the ceiling is a pretty good sized chunk of wood. And when I say pretty good size, let's say on the order of 100 to 1,000 times as massive as a particular uh, projectile from a bullet. So for instance, if you're firing a, a, a gun, then the casing of the gun uh, of the bullet is going to contain the actual projectile and the powder. And when it explodes, the powder blows the projectile out the front of the out the front of the casing. And that little projectile is the mass that I'm comparing. That little mass should be about one hundredth to even one one thousandth of the mass of this big block. I'm going to call the mass of this big block big M. And I'm going to say that right over here is an object of mass little m, but because it's been fired out of a gun, it's going to have a rather big velocity. So the velocity is going to be like this. So I'm using that big V like I sometimes save for volume. Okay. Now, what we're trying to do is figure out what this muzzle velocity is. In other words, what's the velocity of the projectile when it leaves the barrel of the gun? So, you know, it's typical to have, you know, six or 700 meters per second, something like that. Uh, we can fire it into a block of wood, and then conservation of momentum tells us that momentum before the collision will be equal to momentum after the collision. That'll get us the velocity of the block of wood with the bullet embedded inside of it just as it leaves after being struck and then we can use conservation of energy to see that this mass is going to uh, be slung upward and we can use that to determine the height and using that I can then have uh, for a given muzzle velocity a given height and that'll give us a way to solve for uh, to solve for the muzzle velocity. So that stage one is just when the bullet's coming towards the mass. Uh, stage two would be 
right here. So let's say this is again the block of wood, but now the block of wood has the actual projectile embedded in it, which I can represent like this. So there's the bullet embedded in it, and now we have a mass of M plus big M, and in fact, this thing is going to take off with a velocity that I'm just going to call V prime. And then stage three is going to be something like, let's say, I'll say it's right here. Uh, let's say this string is going to come back here and this string is going to come back here and now the wood block is going to be basically like this and this has a mass of m plus big m but now has a height of h okay and of course it still has the bullet inside that's why i drew all the uh or that's why i put the m plus m there so what we got to do with this is we're going to follow the plan that i just spelled out which was using conservation of momentum to go from a to b and then use conservation of energy to go from b to c so first off solution Oh, and I probably should just write this down so you know. Uh, what is V in terms of H, M, and big M? That's really what we're wanting to know. So I can immediately take conservation of momentum, which basically says little m times big V is the total momentum we had before the collision. And then after the collision, we had little m plus big M because the mass of the bullet has been stuck inside the big block of wood. And that whole thing is moving to the left or to, excuse me, to the right with a velocity of V prime. That gives us that V prime is equal to M over M plus big M times the muzzle velocity, which is ultimately what we're looking for. Now I'm going to use conservation of, moment of energy. And conservation of energy, remember, what I've taught you guys is work in plus U initial plus K initial is equal to work out plus U final, plus K final, plus E loss. And I want to remind you guys that there's no definitive definition of what's the correct thing to put in W out or in W in or even in E loss. Uh, I've just noticed over years that it's more often than not that uh, you, if you have any, any non-conservation of energies, any non-conservative terms, uh, it's more likely to have more than one on the uh, uh, taking energy out of the system and more likely to just take one and put it into the system. So that's why I left one term on the left and two terms on the right. But to be honest with you, uh, the main thing is all you need to do is account for each energy source, whether it's an input source. Uh, you might have to use five different terms on the left-hand side for energy put into the system. And you want to make sure all of those are positive. And the same thing on the right-hand side, uh, you might have 12. It doesn't matter as long as you count each one exactly once and they're all positive. The only thing when you're using this version of conservation of energy, the only time you should get a negative is when uh, you use U is equal to negative G M M over R, that particular type of potential requires that negative sign. So when you're using that, yeah, it's going to be negative, but the E loss term uh, and the W out term and the W in term 
uh, should be no negatives. So no negatives terms, but maybe this guy. Okay, so that's what I'm saying. And the only time you use that is when you're dealing with heights that are comparable to the radius of the Earth. So if you're talking about uh, dealing with something that's above the radius of the Earth or above the radius of the sun or above the surface of the sun or above, quote unquote, surface, or above the surface of Mars, for instance, and that distance is literally comparable to the radius, then you should probably be using that U instead of MGH. All right, so back to this. Now we have a uh, a block with a bullet embedded in it moving at velocity V prime given by M plus M or M divided by parentheses M plus big M, uh, all that times the muzzle velocity. So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm uh, basically starting to examine it after it's been embedded in there. So there's no work in. There might have been work in during the collision process, but by working with momentum, we didn't have to consider that at all. And it already had it from the bullet, so we didn't have to consider uh, what kind of work went into accelerating the bullet as, as well. Uh, we also had that uh, no potential energy was there because we can at will define the zero of energy at any height we want. I just chose to write it as zero at the bottom of the block when the block is just hanging. So here's another zero right there. Uh, I am not, in some sense, I'm actually am doing, uh, putting some work out and the work out would be lifting the block, but we've already counted that with potential energy. So there's no need to do that one as well. Uh, e loss, uh, could be a workout or it could be energy loss due to friction or something like that. Again, you'd have to make it positive, but we don't have any of that going on. So that's going to be zero. And not only that, when it reaches its max height, the kinetic energy is going to have to be zero. So what we ultimately get is just plain one half M plus big M times V prime squared is equal to m plus big m times g times h so that's basically setting the potential energy equal to the kinetic energy or the other way around if you want to say it that way so right now what i can see is this m plus m and this m plus m cancels out and i can go ahead and multiply both sides by two and that will give me 2GH on the right. Now, in so doing, I'm now going to get V prime squared is equal to 2 times G times H like that. But I already know what V prime is in terms of things we knew. I've got that solved for up there. So to square it, I'm going to take uh, M and square that. I'm going to take little m plus big m put that in parentheses and square that and now i'm going to take the muzzle velocity the big v and square that as well all of that's going to be equal to 2 times g times h now i can take a square root of both sides like this and when i do that I end up getting M over M plus big M times big V is equal to the square root of 2GH. So this will finally get me the muzzle velocity. The muzzle velocity, big V, is going to be equal to M plus big M over little m all of that times the square root of 2GH. That was a bad looking H. Got scoliosis or something. So 2GH. There you go. And that's it. That's the answer. Anybody have any questions with that one? So just as an example, uh, and by the way, this was example two. 
So let me write it this way. Just as an example, let's do this. Let's call this example three. If M is equal to 0 0.030 kilograms and let's say uh, let's say big M is equal to 3.00 kilograms and I know I've got run on ands there. I don't care. Uh, let's also say that, let's say H is equal to 10 centimeters, 0 0.10 meters. Let's see what that would give for my uh, muzzle velocity. So V equals question mark, and we'll just work this out just for the fun of it. So I'm going to say V, according to this equation, is supposed to be 0 0.030 kilograms plus, make sure I got all this right, yes, plus 3.00 kilograms. Notice that is a factor of 100 larger than the, sh uh, than the actual projectile. All that's going to be divided by 0 0.030 kilograms. And I have no idea if I'm making up good, uh, good data here. Uh, I, what I knew I wanted to do was make sure that the mass was at least a factor of 100 bigger than the mass of the shell. Other than that, I was just winging it. So that's all going to be times the square root of 2 times 9.80 meters per second per second times h, which is 0 0.10 meters. Notice that becomes a meter squared per second squared under a square root, which gives you a meter per second, and then times kilograms over kilograms, which is still a meter per second. So I'm going to take uh, the square root of 2 times 9.8 times 0.1, and that gives me 1.4. I'm going to multiply that by 3.03. .03. And now I'm going to divide that by 0 0.03. And that gives me actually a rather crappy muzzle velocity of 141.4 meters per second. So, uh, yeah, as I told you, my, my data wasn't that great. I actually only had two sig figs, too. So, technically, this, this digit and that digit are completely fabricated, not subs uh, substantiated by data. Uh, and that's the answer. Anybody have any questions on that? Okay, so hopefully that at least shows you how to actually uh, solve a, a problem like the uh, ballistic pen pendulum, but also shows you how to apply the equation so that you maybe know how. Uh, I will tell you, your book does another railroad cr uh, car problem. This is a good problem to do, but it's really, really simple. So what they're doing here is this was the, the railroad problem from example 9-3 in the textbook, which is just like one of the ones I worked last time, where basically one car is moving, runs into the other car, and they stick together. What they want you to calculate is how much kinetic energy was lost. So what you're supposed to do is calculate one half the sum of the two masses, m plus m, times the final velocity squared that's the total kinetic energy after they collided and stuck together and of course we already calculated what that final velocity was in example nine three of the book and then you're supposed to subtract that from the initial kinetic energy that the whole system had which if i remember correctly the, the one car was sitting still and the other car was moving towards it with some velocity so that one's just going to be one half times the mass of the one car times the velocity of the one car squared. So you're going to subtract that quantity from the other kinetic energy, and you'll see that quite a bit of kinetic energy was lost in that uh, perfectly inelastic collision.
Anybody have any questions on that? All right. Now that I got that, I want to get you into the uh, routine of solving uh, two-dimensional problems. So we're talking two or 3D problems with conservation of a mass, uh, excuse me, conservation of momentum and conservation of kinetic energy. Now, here's the general problem, and I'll draw it out as follows. So what we're going to imagine is a particle that happens to be moving along the horizontal axis like this. And then at the origin of the coordinate system, there's going to be another mass right here. That's supposed to be at the origin. Let me keep stretching it until it looks like it's in there. It does not look like it's in there at all. I hate this. I hate oh, I hate everything about this. I'm going to say delete. Delete. Okay. <laughs> so let's do it again. There you go. Okay, so now I've got that at the right coordinate. This is, in fact, going to be my y-axis, and this is, in fact, going to be my positive x-axis. And this is all before the collision. Now, after the collision, what's going to happen is one of these particles is going to go off this way at an angle. Now, what I'll do is I'll call this angle theta a prime, and I'll say uh, this velocity is VA prime that way. And then the other one is going to leave with, I'm going to use another color too. Uh, the other one might leave at this angle. Let's call this theta B prime. And in fact, what that's going to be is a particle with a velocity VB prime like that. And VA prime. Now, the one part I didn't say initially was that this particle will have a velocity VA and this particle has a mass MA and this particle has a mass MB. Okay? And I'll put a little purple in here so we can sort of say we think that's the one that went down, uh, but it might not be. And we think this is the one that went up was the MA, but again, it might not be. For instance, when you're dealing with protons, proton collision, uh, we really don't know which proton goes up, which proton goes down. Now... You might think that we're looking at a highly specialized case here. It looks like we're considering only cases where the initial velocity of the second particle is zero and the special case where the actual other particle is sitting still. It turns out that we're pretty proficient in physics at switching coordinate systems, so we can at any time... Uh, move to a coordinate system in which the second particle is sitting still and two in which the first particle is moving along the x-axis. So we've lost no generality whatsoever. Uh, and in fact, we can now do conservation of momentum. And this is linear momentum, but I'm just calling it momentum because we haven't touched angular momentum yet, but conservation of momentum uh, in the x direction is going to give us this equation. We're going to have ma va is equal to, and I'm going to use everything positive, so if anything happens to go in the negative direction, it'll come out as a negative. So in this case, I'm going to say ma va prime cosine theta a prime plus mb vb prime cosine theta b prime. Okay, so that's the conservation of momentum in the x direction. And since I said we could orient our coordinate system so that the initial particle uh, mb is not moving and the initial particle va is moving along the x-axis, that means there's no y component of momentum before collision. 
So we get yet another equation for the y, and that equation is zero is equal to m a v a prime sine theta a prime plus m b v b prime sine theta b prime. Okay, that's just if momentum's conserved. Uh, so you can see with two equations, you're only allowed two unknowns. So for instance, one of the examples your book does is uh, assume we know both theta A prime and theta B prime. If you do that, then you can just solve for VA prime and VB prime. And, uh, you know, that's that's one of the examples your book does. However, if you also know that it's an elastic collision, so then you can say cons conservation of kinetic energy. But this is only true if the collision is elastic. And in the math world, we would read that as if with two Fs, which means if and only if uh, collision is elastic. So that's the word you want to look for here. And now we can go ahead and, and substitute that equation. Uh, obviously, you're going to have a one-half MAVA squared. But to be honest with you, all the terms are going to have one-half in it. So why even waste your time putting a one-half in there? So I'm just going to write it as MAVA squared plus M, oh excuse me i shouldn't say plus i should say equals m a v a prime squared plus m b v b prime squared and let's label this equation one let's label this equation two and let's label this equation three Okay, so now in this case, if you happen to have three unknowns, you can solve the problem as well. So let's try for another example. This would be example four. Let's start off breaking this up a little bit. So let's say this is example four. Okay, I got to remember to take it off of the automatic draw. Example four, what we're going to imagine in this case is uh, two pool balls. Let's imagine two pool balls. And uh, for instance, you're hitting a cue ball and the cue ball is going to run into a non cue ball that happens to be sitting still. OK, and the cue ball is going to be moving at three meters per second in the X direction. And then both the cue ball and the other ball are going to move off at 45 degrees above and 45 degrees ab below the X axis. So let's draw it this way. I'm going to say. Well, that's really nice to draw this really wonderful white ball. <laughs> and I'm realizing now that white is probably not the best uh, thing to put around that. But anyways, there's the cue ball. And the cue ball, if I at least put a velocity on it that's not white, maybe that'll help. The velocity for that, VA, is equal to 3.0 meters per second. And the in this case, since we're using billiard balls, MA is equal to mb is just equal to m. In other words, it's not going to matter at all. And I'll put this around just to make it look like <laughs> you can see the white ball. Now that's going to run into, let's say, a purple ball. And this purple ball has vb equal to 0. And then after the collision, what's going to happen? Whoa. What's going to happen after the collision is this is our x-axis. And we're going to get the, let's say, the white ball.
moving upward with this new velocity at 45.0 degrees. And we're also going to get the purple ball moving at negative 45.0 degrees. Okay. And this will be VB prime. And of course, this one up here would be VA prime. What we want to know is VA prime equals question mark and VB prime equals question mark. So we're not saying this is elastic. We're just telling you these are pool balls colliding. Okay. So I'll put over here just as a reminder, not elastic. Okay. So let's make our solution. So with our solution, what we can do is we can see from equation one that notice the M's all cancel out. So I'm going to get VA, which actually I'll go ahead and put a number in here. That's 3.0 meters per second is equal to VA prime cosine 45.0 degrees plus VB prime cosine negative 45.0 degrees. And yeah, that's the way I drew. I was just making sure that I, in fact, gave the white one the correct velocity and the uh, purple one the correct velocity. And then from equation two, I'm going to get zero is equal to VA prime times the sine of 45.0 degrees plus VB prime times the sine of negative 45.0 degrees. Okay. So if I start with equation two, what I can see is that the sine of, uh, since we know sine, for instance, is what we call an odd function. So the right-hand side of sine starts at zero, goes up to a max, comes to zero, goes down to a minima, and then comes back up. Whereas if you go to the left of the y-axis, it goes down first and then up first. So you can see it's turned upside down. If you change x to negative x, you get the negative of the value. So uh, this right here, is the same thing as negative sine 45.0 degrees, okay? So in this case, we can say zero is equal to VA prime sine 45.0 degrees minus VB prime sine 45.0 degrees. So you can see now that the two sines of 45 cancel out and that gives us that VA prime has got to be VB prime. And that should make some sense just from symmetry. Why would one go 45 degrees, the other one go the opposite 45 degrees but not have the same speeds? So that's part of the answer. Now we can plug this back into one. Okay. And I'm saying plug VA prime equals VB prime into one. So when I do that, I'm going to get three. Whoa, Nelly. When I do that, I'm going to get 3.0 meters per second is equal to now, remember, we have a common, let's say, VA prime. So I'm going to say VA prime times the cosine of 45.0 degrees. Now, cosine's actually even. So this is sine is odd. And I should mention that cosine 
is even. So if you replace the cosine of x, if you replace the x with negative x, you just get cosine of x again. So cosine of x is equal to cosine of negative x. Uh, so we're good on that one. So in this case, I got VA prime plus, uh, times cosine 45 plus VA prime again, because I'm using the fact that VA prime is equal to VB prime. And I'm using the fact that cosine is even to say that this is also cosine 45.0 degrees. Now from that, uh, we can basically say that VA prime is equal to 3.0 meters per second. If I factored out a uh, VA prime, I'd get cosine 45 times VA plus VA, R2 VA. Uh, and that works pretty good. So I could just say the right-hand side is VA prime times parentheses 2 cosine 45, in which case I'm just going to divide this by 2 times the cosine of 45.0 degrees, which I bet you know what the cosine of 45 degrees is. But either way, I'm going to say 3 divided by parentheses 2 times cosine 45, close parentheses, and that gives me 2.12 meters per second. And that two is an extra sig fig. I'm going to say that's equal to VA prime. But remember, VA prime is equal to VB prime. So this also implies VB prime is equal to 2.12 meters per second as well. And that's our answer. Anybody have any questions on that one? All right. I don't see anybody typing in any chat. I don't hear anybody asking questions. So I guess I'll keep on chugging. All right. Now that we've got that, uh, let's go ahead and attack a problem where I want to have three unknown. So uh, we'll examine yet another problem. This is going to be example five. So let's say example So with this example, what I'm going to imagine is uh, basically two identical particles because it makes it a little easier to not have to deal with the masses. So uh, let's imagine two identical particles. I'm going to have one right here, and I'm going to have one right here. And I am going to say that the target's actually at rest. So I'm going to draw a velocity right here. VA is going to be equal to, let's say this one's uh, 6.5 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. And let's say VB is equal to zero. And let's say MA equals MB equals the mass of a proton like that, okay? Now, after the collision, what's going to happen is basically one of these is going to move off at some angle. I'm going to try to draw my coordinate system again. So that looks pretty good there. That looks pretty good there. There's my y-axis, there's my x-axis, and what I'm going to do is I am going to imagine that one of these guys, whoa, one of these guys goes off this way with a velocity. Uh, let's just assume that's angle A. So this will be VA prime. This angle is going to be theta A prime is equal to 60.0 degrees. 
and then the other one's going to move off at some different velocity, at some different angle. And that velocity and angle would be VB prime, and the angle would be theta B prime like that, okay? What I want to know is VA prime equals question mark, VB prime equals question mark, and theta B prime equals question mark, okay? So let's start it out. This is an elastic collision. Okay. So since it's elastic, we have at our disposal all the equations I just wrote. Uh, equation one, for instance, well, I should probably write this in blue. So equation one, for instance, is going to be M. Actually, since the M's are all the same, I'm just going to write VA is equal to VA prime cosine theta A prime plus VB prime cosine theta B prime. I'm going to say 2. 0 is equal to VA prime sine theta A prime. Somebody just came in. And I'm going to say plus VB prime. Uh, oops, should be sine theta. Uh, sine theta B prime. Okay. And I also have equation 3. And this one's going to be uh, actually, again, canceling out the uh, M's. Oh, crap, I hate it when it happens. All right, canceling out the M's, I'm going to get VA squared is equal to VA prime squared plus VB prime squared like that. So those are our three equations. So the first thing I'm going to do is work with one. Now, notice the steps I'm taking here. This this comes in handy every time you're trying to solve uh, any problem where you know one angle and uh, you need to know the other angle and the other two velocities. What I'm going to do is get all the VA stuff on the left-hand side. So I'm going to get VA over here. And I'm going to get the VA prime cosine theta A prime on the other on the same uh, the left side too, and then I'm going to square them. So I'll say VA minus VA prime cosine theta A prime is equal to VB prime cosine theta B prime, and now I'm going to square both sides like this. And that is, in fact, going to give me VA squared minus 2VA, VA prime, cosine theta A prime, plus VA prime squared, cosine squared theta A prime. The right-hand side will be easy-peasy compared to that one. That's just going to be VB prime squared, cosine squared, theta b prime okay now i'm going to do the same thing with equation two i'm going to pull the va sine uh, va prime sine theta a prime to the left side and then square it of course when it comes on the left it'll be negative but once you square it that won't matter so uh this equation i'm just going to refer to as one prime this one i'm going to refer to as two prime and it's going to be, in fact, uh, VA prime squared sine squared theta A prime equals VB prime squared sine squared theta B prime. Okay. And then finally... Uh, I'm just going to, I think I would like to leave this 
last one exactly in the way that it is. Let's look at that and see. Uh, yeah, I think I... I think I do. No, no, I I will mess with three later. Okay. I just want to work this out and see what comes out. So the reason why I'm doing this is you might notice that uh, the VA prime squared term in both equation one prime and two prime Notice in one prime, it's got VA prime squared, cosine squared, theta A prime. And notice in uh, two prime, it's got VA prime sine squared, theta A prime. So if I add these two equations, what you get is V a squared minus 2 VA VA prime cosine theta A prime is equal to, or excuse me, plus. Now I'm going to add VA prime squared, which both terms have a VA prime squared in it, so I can factor that out. And all I get is cosine squared theta A prime plus sine squared theta A prime, which is just one. So this side's just going to become VA prime squared. Similarly, the VB prime squared, I can factor that out and I get cosine squared plus sine squared again. So that just gives me VB prime squared. So that's what happens when I add those two equations. And this can be uh, quite nice because now I can take equation three and I can solve it, for instance, for let's say VB prime. So, uh, Let's say right here, VB prime squared is going to be equal to VA squared minus VA prime squared. So I can actually uh, use that to get rid of VB prime. So if you look down here, I do have an actual VB prime. So now I'm going to combine, let's say combine uh, let's call this equation uh, four. So I'm going to combine equation four and let's call this one equation a uh, poop. Let's call this one equation five instead of four. That'll make it easier. So let's call this equation over here four. And let's call this equation over here five. Okay. So when I do that, I'm going to get VA squared minus 2VA, VA prime, cosine theta A prime plus VA prime squared is equal to, here's where I'm making use of VB prime. This is going to be VA squared minus VA prime squared. Okay. So with that, you can see that this VA squared is going to cancel out with this VA squared and the other VA prime squared, that's just going to come to the other side and make it twice as big. So with that in mind, I could, for instance, uh, yeah, what I'll do is I'll take this entire thing, which is a negative term and pull it to that side. And I'll take this entire thing, which is negative, and I'll pull it to that side just to make uh, myself a, a little more comfortable by not having to deal with a bunch of negatives. <laughs> okay. So when I bring the VA prime squared, which is negative on the right hand side, to the left hand side, I get 2VA prime squared is equal to now the 2 VA, VA prime cosine. 
theta a prime like that. We can see right here that we got a common factor of VA prime right here and right there. So now I can say that VA prime. Oh, I also got a two I can cancel out. So I'm going to cancel out this two right here and right here. But now I can see that VA prime is just equal to VA cosine theta A. So I'm going to say VA, which we said was, oh, well, I'll just write it this way. VA cosine theta A prime. So VA prime is equal to VA. That was, I thought I got yeah, 6.5 times 10 to the fifth meters per second times the cosine of 60 degrees. Yep, I did have cosine. I'm just making sure of that. Times cosine of 60 degrees. That's going to give me 6, oh, got to turn the calculator on, 6.5 e to the fifth times cosine 60. That gives me 3.25. Again, one extra sig fig, 3.25 times 10 to the fifth meters per second is equal to VA prime. I can circle that off. Okay. Now I need to find out VB prime, which luckily I have that in equation four. So from equation four, I can say that VB prime is at least squared is equal to VA squared minus VA prime squared. So I can say this is going to be VA squared, which is 6.5 times 10 to the fifth meters per second squared minus 3.25 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. This is a 10 to the fifth, by the way. Actually, let me make that just a little clearer because it doesn't look too good to me. And that one, of course, has to be squared as well. So I'm going to say 6.5 e to the fifth squared minus 3.25 e to the fifth squared gives me 3.17. Again, extra sig fig times 10 to the... Whoa! Yeah, and now I got to take square root of that. Sorry about that. <laughs> I forgot to take square root. Actually, I, I could leave that because that's already squared. Let's leave that. That's 3.17. Actually, I'll say 3.1688. times 10 to the 11th meters squared per second squared. So that gives me that VB prime should equal the square root of that. And that gives me 5.63. One extra sig fig again. 5.63 times 10 to the 5th. So I now have velocity VB prime. And now all I have to do is plug all this into two, and that'll give me the other uh, theta B. So I'm going to say from equation two, in this case, I'm going to say zero is equal to, uh, I'm not even going to worry about the factor of 10 to the fifth because you can uh, see that it's clearly going to cancel out, but I'll just say, VA prime, which was 3.25 times uh, sine of 60 degrees plus, now I've got VB prime, which is 5.63. Again, that's an extra digit. That's an extra digit. And this time times the sine of theta B prime. So theta B prime 
is going to be equal to 3.25 times the sine of 60. That gives me 2.81. And now I'm going to divide that by 5.63. Notice I will be having a negative, so this angle is going to come out to be negative. So I'm going to divide this by 5.63. And then I'm going to take the inverse tangent of it, and it turns out to be the in, or excuse me, the inverse sine of it, and it turns out to be the inverse sine of 0.5, which I think we all know. And lo and behold, we get 30 degrees. So the answer is actually negative 30.0 degrees is theta b. In fact, there's a, a general rule that basically if you have a two-dimensional collision with identical masses and it's elastic, then the sum of the two angles will always add up to give you 90. Notice 60 plus uh, the negative of 30, which is, you know, just take the magnitude of it, then you'll see the angles are, six, are 90 degrees apart. Any questions on that one? All right. Well, I did already work a conservation of momentum problem uh, last, or excuse me, a center of mass problem last time. Uh, I did add some more center of mass problems in uh, our module. So check those out. There's one I do with a train car, for instance, and stuff like that. Yes, please, everybody go ahead and type in your first and last names. Uh, I will leave this be because I think we've covered enough. Uh, you've seen how we can calculate the center of mass using the integral formulas. If you need any more help on that, by all means, ask me. I'll be glad to uh, make up some more examples. There's a ton of them in my YouTube channel, so just do a search for center of mass. Uh, you should probably find plenty. Uh, your book has some examples of discrete centers of mass as well as uh, continuous centers of mass to calculate with integrals and it's got examples like that so feel free to check any of those out or ask me anybody have any questions well thanks for coming everybody uh, i'll wait for the last person to leave i see shakela's here so uh you're free to go and like i said i won't leave until the last person splits i had a question yes ma'am um, I was wondering about this week's um lab. It's supposed to be due today. No, I just hadn't had a chance to change that yet. It won't be due until Sunday, like normal. Okay, okay, let's make sure. I didn't want to miss <laughs> yeah, it. do it real fast, real fast. <laughs> right. <laughs> now you're good, Shakela. I appreciate it. Okay. Well, you have a good day and enjoy that. Is there any other things I can help you with while I got you here? Um, no, I think that is it. Okay, well, I, let me know. I you was looking at my text um, or grade. whatever. What's oh, that? One more thing. I was looking at my grades. I know it's like really, really late, but I didn't know that I didn't take the first test. Yeah, I, I sent an email about that. I was wondering when you were ever going to reply. You never did. And I was like, well, maybe she hadn't paid attention. So, yeah, just uh, you haven't done it yet. So, uh, what I'll do if I open it back up, you think you can get it done by, let's say, uh, Friday? Yes, definitely, because I thought I was one of the ones that have done all the tests. I didn't know I missed one myself. Gotcha. Yeah, I'll do it for Friday, and I won't take any points off for it being late. Okay. Okay. Good luck, Shakela. All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. I've stopped recording, baby. You did or the puppies did? Oh, is he? Where that chasing chase? Oh, hey, buddy. I see ya.